things. Glory to Thee. Glory to Father, Son, and all Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. One God in three persons. Even the birds are gathering around us, I see. A mockingbird just making sure I say the right thing. So we have a beautiful garden around us. Thanks be to God. He's given us so many things to thank Him for, to praise Him for. We are in a real battle, and all of the Orthodox teachings yes. come to bear when we are faced with these epidemics of sorts. Pandemic, in this case, it's worldwide. And the main thing we want to avoid is the very thing Christ came in His resurrection to destroy in us, and that is the fear of death. If we are in fear of death, the devil can control us. And the people that are oppressors by nature, that don't have the Lord Jesus Christ guiding them in freedom and in joy, they will oppress others with the oppression which they feel from the enemy of our souls. In fear, they will rule by fear. Remember that. People who are fearful have to rule by law and make you fearful of their application of the law. Now, there is something that happens in the childhood. If you look through some of these governors and then it goes down to health uh, inspectors like we have here, in unelected, what are they doing? They're going above and beyond what is required by the state and especially by President Trump, who has freed us to go into business again and to practice the free market system that has made America so attractive. If you go into Britain, and I've been there in many countries, France, uh, Germany, Italy, you will see a class system set up, as we have said, by the Frankish uh, lords and ladies long ago. They had to exercise their oppression, so they set oppressors in rule above people. The Roman peasantry, the Roman populace, who was Orthodox uh, Christian from the time of the Apostles, all of the saints around here, especially Saint Irenaeus, uh, apostle uh, to France, to Gaul, in the 100s, 180, 200. These were people with apostolic succession. And they were preaching and teaching the Orthodox faith in the midst of great persecution, by the way. It took great courage. In fact, after Irenaeus was put in as bishop of what is today Lyon, France, on the river there, uh, we have a huge persecution coming through another pagan emperor of the empire, and he decimated everybody in the city uh, who had found Christ through the preaching and teaching of wonderful Saint Irenaeus. So this is ongoing, and if we allow oppression and the oppressors to overcome our Constitution, which is a gift from God in freedom of expression, of speech, of choice, which is right in the Orthodox Christian scriptures that we teach, and also freedom, it goes without saying, of worship of Christ our God. We are essentially a Christian nation, although like Constantine, when he uh, brought in Christianity into the empire in the fourth century, everyone else was allowed to worship, but Christianity would find favor because it best expressed the free people 
who are ruled freely by the law that they obey, and it is not restrictive. It is based on Christ's commands to make freedom of choice for his way or to be not uh, obedient to the emperor, and that carried certain punishments. Romans 13 and 14 will warn us that sometimes the governing authorities put in place by God, in our case through elections, uh, sometimes they must put pressure on uh, uh, leaders who are beneath them and on the people, anyone in the populace who does not uh, obey, who is openly reckless in obeying laws and endangering themselves and others. So we have this strange, <laughs> uh, strange unmasking, as one person has put it, of the people in power. Either they are free and adults and they, they govern people properly, or they are strange and awkward and have some sort of law that they think they have to uh, obey themselves and then press on people like a big weight. Now, I always go back to the childhood of the individual because each person is, is that, an authentic person. Sometimes they have been wounded in childhood and I do think that those who are stuck are frozen in this childish imitation of who they think a parent is. Uh, I think they've been wounded in childhood, usually. They've had some kind of unreasonable law put upon them by either church or parents or whatever, and they haven't had to reason it out because it is unreasonable. And so they must just emotionally say, I've got to obey this, even though it doesn't make sense. I think this is put in place by cults, churches, uh, whatever, families, close families can lay down laws and uh, requirements that uh, require obedience. If you don't obey, you are shunned by the rest of the group. Of course, the biggest problem in all of this is the nationwide and worldwide federation of Catholic schools and if I go to, say, a reporter or someone who is obviously pushing an ideology, I will invariably find Catholic school children who are told, uh, no matter what, you must uh, realize that the Pope is infallible, and the children see their parents who are anything but infallible. How can an adult, no matter who he is, be without any mistake? So a lot of times you have Catholics, even in their 50s and 60s, and I have met them in my long life, and the first thing they will say is, who is your Pope? We have a Pope. He's infallible. This is from their childhood people. This is really unreasonable. Now, another thing could happen, and that is you have a communist ideology, which is like the air we breathe since the 1960s. The hippie generation and their children are in charge now. This is the free for all, everything goes. But there are certain things, there are little keywords like racism and uh, hate speech and uh, degrees in social justice. That means the person applies what he has learned in university to everyone else, their idea of what is just. If it looks wrong to the communist ideology of going along with the group, it's actually groupism. It's an anarchy of the groups. And you must obey them or you will be ostracized and in some cases punished 
by the police, by actual imprisonment. God made us reasonable creatures. He wants leaders that will reason with us and let us know why we do things. And we have a constitution in case we have bad leaders. We can go to the constitution and say this is the freedom that we are given under our constitution which is based to a large part on the freedoms by which Christ has set us free. Freedom to choose, freedom to speak, freedom to worship without a state religion confining us in some way. So these are things just that have been brought to my mind and you may find them helpful since I've lived through this, uh, what, 60 years now of tremendously uh, uh, twisted idea of leadership. Now, what I've noticed also online, and I want to make you aware of this, if you are researching Orthodox Christianity, you almost always have to go to Orthodox Wiki, W-I-K-I, or uh, something to that extent. OrthodoxChristian.org is all right. It has problems with uh, Seraphim Rosa. If you try and search out online, for instance, I'll give you my example, the Nicene Creed. I wanted to put a uh, a picture, a photo of that Nicene Creed, so that when we talked about it here in our program, the people could see it and uh, memorize it and, and realize what the original creed was. So fine, I found out of maybe 20 choices, I found two that were the original Nicene Creed, and that means without the additions made by Charlemagne in 800. We call it the Filioque and the Son. So the Holy Spirit, according to Charlemagne, who contradicted Christ himself, by the way, said the Holy Spirit comes from the Father and the Son. And this, of course, in effect, denies the person of the Holy Spirit. He becomes a little dove that you see in their pictures. You see the Father and the Son and then a little dove between them. I'm, it's ridiculous. And that has led to so many problems. The Dark Ages, as I've said, in the medieval uh, Europe is a sign that their faith was completely misplaced. They had the wrong teaching, and this would lead to wrong prayer, wrong worship, wrong governance, unenlightened by the light of the Holy Spirit from Christ. So the second thing I tried, looking at the Nicene Creed now lately, nowhere to be found was the Orthodox original creed. Nowhere. I would click on original Nicene Creed. The Spirit comes from the Father and the Son. There is the filioque, the addition, sitting there as the original hundred times. Now, this has happened just maybe two years after I originally looked it up. I'm going to make a point here, but I'll give you a second example of my problem. Just last week, I looked up Orthodox monasteries to find my favorite, wonderful Mother Diodora, who is in an Orthodox monastery in Germany, the upper part of Germany, Saxony area. And I had found her easily three weeks ago or so. All of a sudden, blacked out. The blackout. What is happening? I could find neither the monastery out of all the lists of monasteries in Germany, Orthodox monasteries I would type in. I'd get Catholic monasteries all the way down do you see something here? If I were suspicious, and I'm getting to be, I would say someone is tracking my searches 
and preventing me from finding any orthodox sources. This they may do to you. If you're tracked in on orthodox searches, you could very well be blacked out. Now, I'm just saying I'm suspicious that this is happening. This is my proof. But I haven't really searched it out much more than this, except for icons. Try and find an icon. Uh, the Incarnation, which is the Mother of the Lord, holding Christ. That's the Mother with the Incarnate Word of God. God and man, Jesus Christ. You will get Fatima. You will get a Mother of Mercy with light shining all over her. You will get EWTN. The Roman Catholic hand, the iron fist in the glove, is now from the EU stretching out on our Facebook. I will tell you another source, EWTN. Let's talk about EWTN. About EWTN, the Catholic network. Now, of course, I'm always ready to give people the benefit of the doubt. And some Catholics are opening their eyes and realizing, like John Paul II uh, in, his, in his letter said, if you want good theology, you go to Orthodox theology and dogma because he knew, slipped up there, but he wrote that he knew this is the origins of the Christian faith. This is the truth from which we can draw, even if we're Catholics, we believe in the man, God, the Pope, and we believe in all this other stuff, you can go there and just apply it to your life. If it's some kind of orthodox thing, it will help you pray, yes. It will help your life because it is life-giving from Scripture, from the Word of God. Of course Catholics need this. He let it slip out. And being from Eastern Europe, he was well aware, believe me, they all know. They know the Uniate, which I will talk about, a priesthood that is started by the Jesuits, in which they want to bring Orthodox under the papal slipper, it's called. EWTN. They give so many false histories, I can't begin to tell you. But since I am older now, I was at the genesis of the charismatic movement. When I first came out of the convent, it was just starting, the Lord was so good. 1963, Dennis Bennett, an Episcopalian minister from Seattle, who asked a Pentecostal African-American pastor to lay hands on him for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So in the Catholics, it was hitting all the denominations. It was the charismatic movement in this denomination, in that, the Episcopalians, then the uh, Bapticostals, of course. So and anyone who did and was hungry, thank God there were some of those, moved out into uh, Pentecostal churches, Assemblies of God, uh, Four Square, begun in the early 1900s. So then we have the Catholics at Notre Dame University and Ann Arbor, Michigan became a satellite of these teachings. They had a commune, a commune of families and everyone else who shared the Holy Spirit baptism and tried to, of course, keep the Catholic, which is kind of a misfit. It's like walking with a, a two left shoes, but tried to keep the uh, Holy Spirit alive and well and ongoing to the 70s. The charismatic movement bloomed. But then in the Catholic Church, the Pope stood back and said, wait a minute, we can't have this. So in each parish, and I think it's 
they put a priest, one of their parish priests, in charge of their charismatic groups that were meeting, and he successfully squashed all of the teachings. He wasn't filled with the Holy Spirit himself. That's why he was there, to put a blanket on it, lest they wandered too far from the uh, prison of the Catholic Church. Now, I'll wrap this up in saying that EWTN attempted to do the Pope's will, uh, uh, the Pope's will, and of course we couldn't tell the real story of how the Holy Spirit came when you prayed, and all of the universities, the Catholic world, especially Notre Dame, Annapolis, but EWTN had to do the bidding of their Pope. And I heard the uh, Women of Grace person say that this is the story of the charismatic movement. A little woman went up to her attic to pray. She was very hungry for the Holy Spirit. And what she did was ask for the Holy Spirit and she received it. She doesn't tell why, how, tongues, gifts, nothing. She received the Holy Spirit. She went down and spread the news to her neighbors and it, soon it went through the whole country. Now that is akin to selling someone the Brooklyn Bridge. It didn't exist, doesn't exist, and will never exist in the Catholic Church that way. Another mind-blowing thing I've seen because I do buzz by EWTN to find out what they're doing. And in the Uniate movement, championed by this Pope and all the Popes, begun in 1500 to help recapture the Orthodox, they needed more people in the, after the Reformation, they needed more people in the church. So the Uniate, which means union with the Pope, you can be Orthodox, divine liturgy, priests, uh, married, all the Orthodox canons, at least most of them. Add the Immaculate Conception, which of course is false because the original sin is false. And add the Filioque, sometimes people insist on it. But otherwise you're under the Pope and you sign away your uh, ability to follow any other bishop, just the Pope. The Jesuits spearheaded this. They spread it all along Eastern Europe. Poland, Czechoslovakia, especially up in Ukraine, we're having such trouble. And of course the Pope is part of the EU. So he can go into Romania, for instance, a totally Orthodox country, and tell them the, the Pope is Orthodox. Uh, will start a seminary because they always have money and the Orthodox people are always very poor most of the time. So they come in, start seminaries. I know because we had friends in Romania and he was captured by this because he could go and get, I mean, you know, there were a lot of, of blessings that went along with it because the devil never runs out of money. So he was, he was telling me how wonderful the seminary was, and I said, wait a minute, do you know what the problems are with the papacy? So I was telling him, this is by email, Romania is a sitting duck because they're coming out from under communism. They're poor, they're desperately poor, and they need to be part of the EU. And the Pope is sitting there saying, come on in, but you have to be under me. So I see this Uniate bishop, he's beardless, that's how you can usually tell, and he has a big, extra big mitre, which looks strange. And I saw his biography they were filming, which is a strange, uh, he was climbing in the caves with, with young girls, it was very strange, questionable, but, but we'll give him the benefit of the doubt. But then he sat down for an interview and he said, you know what happened in Romania, we've come out of communism. Catholics were put in prisons by communists and tortured until they became, are you sitting down, until they became orthodox. If they did not convert, they were killed. 
I nearly fell out of my chair. This is a huge lie, but Stalin always said, if you're going to tell a lie, tell a big one. And no, will no one will imagine that you would dare tell a lie at this pig. So he told this huge Pinocchio lie, and and he was banking on Americans seeing this, and of course not knowing any history. This is what is so vital. The slander against orthodoxy is ongoing. And I've told you before, it's very vicious. I was attacked physically by a priest of this Uniate group. So my Lord and my God, this is extremely dangerous. It is false information. They're taking over Wikipedia online. They're taking over the Orthodox sources. Mm -hmm. Look up Jerusalem Patriarchate. You will get the Latin, what they call Patriarch, only in Jerusalem. Otherwise, he's Cardinal. So just be aware, dear Orthodox catechumens especially, you are being faced with quite a task. It is not impossible. If you have questions, again, call us at the number that is given to you. Uh, be not afraid. We are, with God's help, in charge. The enemy is under our feet. Since the resurrection of Christ and the defeat of death and the routing of Satan. Never forget that. And we will judge these angels. 1 Corinthians 5, not be judged by them, toll house believers. You better get that straight because we believe in scripture, not in made up false monks' little teachings. Now let's go on to how we do worship. After all of this, we need to get our minds straight, the plumb line of truth from the apostles drawn from scripture like the creed. Everything is scriptural. And we'll start out with divine liturgy, understanding what happens in divine liturgy and how it is meant to set our life straight for the week ahead and for our life which lies ahead. We, as priests, whenever we are about to begin the Divine Liturgy, should always remind ourselves, as we stand before the Holy Table, Christ is here, standing before the Holy Table. It's Christ who is offering the Divine Liturgy. I am merely joined with Christ, serving with Him and under Him. We should never celebrate the liturgy without having vividly before us, in the eyes of our heart, the immediate presence of Christ, the one true priest. The role of Christ as the true priest in the service is underlined in the well-known words of the prayer during the Cherubic hymn. You are the one who offers hosts of angels and archangels who perform the liturgy in heaven. And in that prayer he says to God, make with our entry an entry of your holy angels celebrating the liturgy with us. So there very clearly we have the idea that at the little entrance as the visible clergy go into the sanctuary at the same time invisibly the hosts of angels are making an entry into the sanctuary this idea of the single action of earth and heaven is underlined in the frescoes that you will sometimes see in Byzantine churches 
most commonly in the drum of the dough. There you see a representation of the great entrum. And you see another figure in Episcopal vestments waiting for the procession at the entrance of the sanctuary. But in this fresco, the figures who are dressed in the vestments of subdeacon, deacon, and priest, they all have wings. They are all angels. And the figure who is waiting at the entrance to the sanctuary to receive the gifts is Christ himself. So in that representation of the angels performing the great entrance, you have a visual illustration of the theme I've been seeking to develop, the unity of earth and heaven. As St. John Chrysostom affirms, those in heaven and those on earth form a single festal assembly that is shared thanksgiving, one single choir. Now, the clearest affirmation of the unity of earth and heaven in the liturgy comes a little later on in the anaphora. It comes when the celebrant says, we thank you also for this liturgy which you have been pleased to accept from our hands. Though there stand around you thousands of archangels and tens of thousands of angels, the cherubim and the seraphim, six-winged and many-eyed, soaring aloft upon their wings, singing, crying, shouting the triumphal hymn and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Now there exactly, very explicitly this time, we find an affirmation of the unity of earth and heaven, of the participation of the angels and archangels in the same act of praise that we are performing on earth. So there, above all, the idea of the earthly heaven is made completely clear. Worship. The first experience concerns my initial acquaintance with orthodoxy. When I was 17 years old, I was wandering through a part of London that I didn't know, and I saw a church with which I was unfamiliar. And so, out of curiosity, or perhaps by divine providence, I decided to go inside. It was a hot, sunny Saturday afternoon. And the church which I went into was in fact the Russian church in London. <coughs> when I entered the church at first, it was dark, I could see nothing. Then I became conscious of a large expanse of polished floor because there were no pews in the church. And my initial sense was this church is completely But Then I realized as my <coughs> eyes became accustomed to the darkness that it wasn't entirely empty. I saw that there were icons around the walls with lighted lamps in front of them. I saw that there was an icon screen with many lighted candles in front of it at the east end. I saw that there were a few people, not very many, elderly people standing near the walls of the church. And then after a time a deacon emerged from behind the screen. And I realized somewhere out of sight there was a choir singing. At this point, my initial impression that the church was empty was completely reversed. 
And I felt this church is not empty, it is full. It is full of invisible presences. It is full of invisible worshippers that this was heaven on earth. And that's why I particularly wanted to develop this theme with you this morning. But let me mention another experience which I had in our church in Oxford. I was performing one Sunday evening an Evkelia, a service of anointing for an elderly lady in our congregation. She was well enough to come to the church so she did the anointing service in the church itself. And there were just three of us there. The old lady, a friend who'd come with her and who read the responses, and I, the officiating priest. And we were each holding a candle. And as we celebrated the service, it gradually grew dark. After the service was over, I saw some people waiting, two or three, at the entrance of the church. So I went to talk with them. And they were Greeks who happened to be passing through Oxford who decided just to look in at the church. And they said to me, where are all the others? I answered, what do you mean? All the others who were at the service they said. No, I said to them, uh, there's just the three of us here at the service. Oh no, they said, we came earlier and through the uh, windows of the church we could see hundreds of people standing with lighted candles and we could hear a large choir singing but we didn't like to come in. Oh no, I said, it's just been the three of us there. But then I thought afterwards, it is never just the two or three of us. Always, whenever we pray, we are taken up into the worship of heaven. Now, forgive me for mentioning those Two examples from my own experience. I expect some of you in your priestly ministry have also had similar experiences. The Divine Liturgy has the power, by God's grace, to unite us with the life and saving work of Christ if we are there and listening carefully. We are united with the worship of the Trinity being celebrated in the heavenly kingdom before the very throne of God. The Kingdom of God, therefore, is meant by Christ to come and dwell with us continually throughout time. Thus, the priest opens the Divine Liturgy with, Blessed is the kingdom of our God and Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. And this is where we enter in to the kingdom by the gospel that is signed and by the sign of the cross by which we receive salvation and the gospel of life. Blessed is the kingdom of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit now and forever unto ages of ages. Amen. And Master, who has appointed in the heavens orders, 
and hosts of angels and archangels. Grant that with our entrance this morning, there will be an entrance of holy angels, glorifying your goodness with us. Here the priest brings out the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. This symbolizes Christ's time on earth in which he healed and delivered all of mankind, restoring them from Satan's snares. Christ continues this work with his believers as they go out into all the world. O Lord, who dwellest among the holies, who art him by the seraphim with the thrice holy voice, glorified by the cherubim, worshipped by all the powers of heaven, thou hast brought all things into being from nothingness, created man in thine own image and likeness, adorned him with every gift, and thou givest wisdom and understanding to those who ask. Thou dost not despise those who have sinned, but has given us repentance for our salvation. And thou hast granted that we, thine unworthy servant, may stand before the glory of your holy altar and offer unto you due worship and glorification. Accept from the mouths of us sinners the thrice holy hymn. Visit us in thy loving kindness. Pardon us of our, our every offense both voluntary and involuntary. Sanctify our souls and our bodies. Grant us to serve you in holiness all the days of our life by the intercessions of the Theotokos and all of the saints whom throughout the ages have been well-pleasing unto you. Amen. Amen. The priest here brings our gifts of bread and wine placing our lives in Christ's hands, the High Priest, which become his humanity offered to the Father with ours. Now he brings out the gifts to the whole congregation that we may name those for whom we are praying and for ourselves. For the right believing hierarchy of the much suffering church. Lift up your gates, you princes, be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall enter in. Let us attend that we may offer the holy oblation. to hymn you, to bless you, to praise you, to give thanks to you, to worship you in every place of your dominion, 
For thou art God inexpressible, inconceivable, invisible, incomprehensible, ever existing, eternally the same, thou and thine only begotten Son and thy Holy Spirit. For all these things we give thanks unto thee and to thine only begotten Son and to thy Holy Spirit. For all the things of which we know and of which we know not, we give thanks unto thee also for this liturgy, which thou hast vouchsafed to accept from our hands, though there stand beside thee thousands of archangels, ten thousands of angels, the cherubim, the seraphim, the six-winged, the many-eyed, the born aloft, and the wing. Let us stand well, let us stand with fear, let us attend that we may offer the holy oblation in peace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you and with thy spirit let us lift up our hearts we lift them up unto the Lord thanks unto the Lord it is meet and right Right to him you, to bless you, to praise you, to give thanks to you, to worship you in every place of your dominion. For thou art God inexpressible, inconceivable, invisible, incomprehensible, ever existing, eternally the same, thou and thine only begotten Son and thy Holy Spirit. For all these things we give thanks unto thee and to thine only begotten Son and to thy Holy Spirit. For all the things of which we know and of which we know not, we give thanks unto thee also for this liturgy, which thou hast vouchsafed to accept from our hands, though there stand beside thee thousands of archangels, ten thousands of angels, the cherubim, the seraphim, the six-winged, the many-eyed, the born aloft, and the winged. O man befriending master, magnificent is your glory, who so loved thy world as to give thine only begotten Son, that all that believe in him should not perish, but have life everlasting. all the economia for us in the night in which he was given up or rather gave himself up for the life of the world took bread in his holy immaculate blameless hands and when he had given thanks and blessed it and hallowed it and broken it he gave it to his holy disciples and apostles saying take eat this is my body which is broken for you for the remission of sin Amen. all of you drank of it this is my blood of the new testament which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sin Amen. Thine own, of thine own, we offer unto thee because of all and for all. We praise thee, we bless thee.
O Lord, who sent down the Holy Spirit at the third hour to thine apostles and disciples, come into our midst now and breathe afresh on us who pray to you. Make this bread the precious body of thy Christ. Amen. Make that which is in this chalice the precious blood of thy Christ, changing them by thy Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 that thou art truly the Christ, the Son of the living God, who came into the world to save sinners. And I believe this is indeed thy most pure body and thy most precious God. of our Lord and his mercy come upon you by his grace and his love for you always now and forever unto ages of ages. Amen. Glory to thee Christ God our hope. Glory to thee. Glory to Father, Son and Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. Holy Father, bless. May he who rose from the dead, Christ our true God, through the prayers of his most pure mother, by the protection of the angelic bodiless host, by the power of the precious life-bearing cross, by the prayers of our fathers among the saints, the great hierarchs, the universal teachers, prayers of St. John Chrysostom, Archbishop of Constantinople, and all of the saints whom throughout the ages have been well pleasing unto thee. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, save thy people 
and bless thine inheritance. Grant victory to the Orthodox Christians over our adversary, and by the power of thy cross preserve thy habitation. And let every adverse power be crushed beneath the sign of the image of the life-bearing cross of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.